Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, best selling author, and he's also my dad. So, Dad, how are you doing today? Really good, Forrest, and I'm looking forward to this a lot. Yeah, same. Today, we're going to be opening up the mailbag and doing another QA episode where we'll be answering questions from our listeners. If you'd like to submit a question to be answered, the best way to do that is by joining us on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com slash being well. And for the cost of a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll receive some bonuses like deep dives into the research behind each episode, transcripts, ad-free versions of what we create, and the ability to contribute to future episodes by doing things like asking questions that we're going to be answering today. So the first question we got and I wanted to start with this one because I think it's a doozy. If you're comfortable talking about it, what do you still find challenging in your relationship as a father and a son? You present what looks like a very ideal relationship, but I also wonder what challenges you still face despite maybe an unusually high level of self-awareness and psychological insight. And for starters, I would say that that's a very flattering question. I'm I'm not sure if I have a, a usually high level of self awareness or not, but I appreciate that that's the image we're presenting over here. So, uh, Dad, you know, what do you think about this? Well, I I think first it's a bold question and yeah. it puts us on our toes. And thinking a bit about it, we knew this question was coming, and you told me. Dad, just talk like a normal person. <laughs> and I was like, well, well, I, I, I do talk like a normal person. And then you said, well, we both mm -hmm. tend to talk in paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I thought I would just sort of maybe riff off that slightly. And yeah. my reflection about it, including my initial little bit of a wince. So yeah, sure. um, we can use our own reactions as grist for the mill. Yeah. And in a funny kind of way, then it reframes having uh, a bit of a reactivation because it's an opportunity to learn about yourself and grow a little maybe and let go a little of something. Perhaps it's a different way of looking at getting, as we used to say back in the 70s, plugged in, right? Stuck in some reactive pattern. And most fundamentally, I think the, if there are issues maybe in our relationship at all, it's because you matter so much to me. Mm -hmm. Right? If I didn't care, yeah, for sure. Totally. Like, whatever. <laughs> you know, some rando person walks by you on the street muttering that you look like an alligator. You just think, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> sorry, you're off your meds or whatever. I don't know what, but, or maybe you're tripping on some really good stuff these days. But no, I'm not an alligator and I'm not going to get upset about it. One of my favorite things in the relationship is throwing you for a loop. So I get to do that occasionally. Yeah, yeah, at least no, in totally. a little way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that like you're the first thing that I just wanted to say in response to this in general is that I think that like one of the single biggest issues in the broader self help industrial complex is the performance of being this like fully realized, totally self-aware, limitless individual who just like isn't borne down by anything. And to be perfectly frank, like we actually know these people and by and large, they're normal people. They've got their own problems. They've got their own insecurities. We, we've had interactions with people directly where like a very spiritually inclined person is also deeply invested in the promotional timeline for their newest book, right? And, and so like, these things are feel like they're not um, like they shouldn't be compatible with each other, and they are because everybody's just a normal person at the end of the day. And yeah, you've got some people who are way at the tail end of the bell curve in terms of uh, self awareness, and I mean like awakening on a spiritual level, however you want to kind of talk about it. But by and large, most people are in sort of the messy middle, including the people who work in this territory and including therapists. And so I just think that it's really important to kind of like say that. Do you have an ongoing issue with me <laughs> that the questioner is asking about or, no, or mean, challenging? I, I think... Challenging is that word. Yeah. What do you find challenging? I found it, I find it challenging whenever you're anything less than um, really pleased with me. And sure. the challenge is internal. 
because it's not your job to always be pleased with me. Yeah. Um, I think it's very similar. Like, I take your opinion very seriously. And I think that also there's the reality of we just spend a lot of time around each other because we have a working relationship. And whenever you spend more than, I don't know what the what the limit is, more than a couple hours a month around a person, I think, you just start to develop a sensitivity toward their tendencies. And things that like wouldn't even tickle you if you bumped into them a couple of times, it, it's kind of like a death of a thousand cuts sort of thing. You bump into them over and over and over again. And even if they're perfectly normal things, um, they just start to wear away after a while. Uh, and and so I think that there, there are some things that are a little bit like that maybe, but again, they're all just like dispositional factors or, or differences in temperament or little communicative tendencies that we have. I wouldn't say that there are any like big rocks in the bucket at this point, which I feel really good about. Um, I do think we have a, an unusually resolved relationship as a parent and a child. There are no like, I, I really feel like I have zero undelivered communications with you, um, which I think is what the questioner is really pointing to when they say, oh, it feels like you have an unusually developed relationship. I think that it's just that like people see us interact and they can kind of tell that there's not a lot of uncommunicated content. Does that make sense? I think that's very perceptive. Yeah. And I'm I'm glad to hear that it's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. definitely feel that way. And, and I feel like you can kind of smell that with people sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, and you want to be a little cautious about this. Like, we don't want to over-infer about other people's relationships from a couple of interactions with them or something. But sometimes you just see people interact for a long enough period of time and you start to feel like, wow, there's just feels like there's some content there that hasn't really been fully, fully fleshed out. I don't know. What do you think about that, Dad? What I feel is that it's great to hang out with you. Oh, well, that's very sweet. Likewise. Yeah. And I think that um, is is an underlying thing in relationships. Mm -hmm. Using our relationship as, as sort of fodder, there's the thought track riding on top, and then there's the feeling being track underneath. Both are important. Mm -hmm. And they affect each other. But at the end of the day, wow, <laughs> I just take the feeling being track over the thought yeah. track. Yeah. Um, and I feel like you have my back. And I know yeah, from the mm -hmm. moment uh, you uh, emerged from your mother uh, that um, I totally have your back, period. Very, very much the same way. I feel like you're pointing to something that's pretty important in there about relationships in general, mm -hmm. where sometimes we just feel like we're on the same team as somebody else, and sometimes we just don't. Yeah. I've had those relationships where I feel like I could say almost anything, mm -hmm. and the person I'm talking to would find something to disagree with. They mm -hmm. would find some fault in what mm -hmm. I was saying. Whereas I think inside of our relationship, I feel like I could say almost anything to you. And for starters, you're going to do your best to find what in it you can agree with or think well of. And then in addition, if there is some kind of bump along the way, if I, if I do communicate something a little unskillfully or, you know, if, if uh, something comes across with more top spend than I intended it to or whatever else, we can go through a real process about it where we talk about it and we can kind of fix it. And we have so many past interactions that have gone well that create a really fertile ground for that sort of a repair process. Well, good. I I feel um, <laughs> I can't find any more gold in them Nar Hills with okay, regard to great. this question. Yeah. Awesome. It's great. So moving on to the next one. And uh, this is maybe more for you, Dad, because I definitely don't feel expert about this. Here it is. I have an obsessive thought I've had for almost 30 years. It's related to something I feel ashamed about, and I've never been able to get it out of my head. How can we deal with obsessive thoughts? Huge question. Yeah, and I mean, we could do a whole episode on this, yeah. as we could with many of these questions, yeah. I don't know the details, but I want to maybe try to offer helpfulness at two levels, in effect. So level one is that the person has referred to something that they're ashamed about, and it seems related to a 30-year history. So 
one of the fundamental ways to deal with this at the roots is to do some kind of process, often with a professional, although we can do a lot on our own, um, to heal that underlying shame and to address maybe an underlying trauma. Maybe there was something that we are ashamed of that we did. There are things that I did 30 years ago that I feel definitely a wince of remorse, if not shame, about them if they come to mind. They don't burden me and preoccupy me in a regular way because I've really done what I'm about to name here, which is to go through a process of forgiving yourself and going through a real process of self-forgiveness that is not superficial, but in fact really gets to the underlying roots of things. So that would be one encouragement to see if there's an exploration to get at the roots of the issue, which is the origin of the shame. And to be clear, we can release burdensome, punishing shame about something while still feeling appropriate remorse about it when we think about it, and while still recognizing that whatever that we what we did uh, violated important values and so forth. Then there's the matter of having obsessive thoughts. And the obsessive thoughts often are related to contamination, fears of contamination, including being contaminated by what we're ashamed of. This was an early insight in psychoanalysis that um, has a lot of validity to it. It's not the only reason why people have obsessive thoughts, but obsessive thoughts often have to do with fears of contamination or uh, fantasies of control, sometimes even grandiose control rooted in what's called magical thinking. For example, that if I keep thinking this thought, somehow my child will not have an accident on the way home from school. Or if I keep thinking this thought, I'll never get cancer. Well, with regard to obsessive thoughts like that, there are varieties of things you could do. There are psychotherapies for obsessive compulsive disorder, including the obsessive aspects of it. And there's certainly wonderful material. Uh, Judson Brewer, who we had on our podcast, said a lot of good things about it in terms of addressing a habit of anxiety. This said, what I could offer right now, a couple things. One, obsessive thoughts can arise. The question becomes, what's alongside them? Alongside that obsessive thought, is there a sense of being invaded by it and helpless in the face of it and belief in it, none of which are good for you. Or alternately, alongside that obsessive thought is a critique of it, rejection of it, mounting of, you know, listing a whole bunch of reasons why it's not true. Is there a sense that you're not going to be hijacked by that thought? It's happening. It's unpleasant, but it's not the whole of you. It's just there. It's annoying, it's like a car alarm, but it's not necessarily meaningful. And um, do you feel rested in emotions and states in the body that uh, are counter to what the obsessive thought in effect is trying to make you feel? So there's a lot you can do to build up resources alongside the obsessive thought, even if the car alarm keeps ringing away. It's, it's kind of hard to make yourself stop thinking a certain thing because then you have to think about the certain thing you don't want to think about and now you're thinking mm -hmm. about it. You know, yeah. don't think of a white elephant, right? Uh, yeah. So that's that. Second thing you can do is that you can uh, recognize that the obsessive thought is an experience like every other experience and it has the nature of all experiences, which you can directly see that they're made of parts that are connected and changing. And thus, it has the nature of emptiness. It's just a thought, the thought. There's that thought. I don't have to believe it. It doesn't have solidity. It's like a cloud, sort of an annoying, fuzzy cloud. I wish it weren't there, but clouds are there sometimes. And so what? It doesn't have to bind me. It doesn't have to burden me. It doesn't have to have weight in my, in my being. The mind is a cave of bats, as one of my teachers mm. put it a long time ago. There's no perfecting the mind. So, you know, your, your thoughts there. And when it passes, like all clouds do, take good care of yourself. You know, mm -hmm. it's tough to be burdened in this way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that I have a lot of specific advice. 
outside of a pretty simple idea about identification, one of the things that we've talked about a lot on the podcast is the difference between having a thought and being a thought or having an emotion and being an emotion. And I think there might be something there that could potentially be useful in this area of obsessive thoughts. To give a personal example of this, I've worked on self-describing as an anxious person uh, and referring to myself as being anxious or like, I feel anxious or something like that, which can give me some separation from it. But if I describe as I am an anxious person, it becomes an identity statement. And identities are much firmer than thoughts or emotions or experiences, right? So are you somebody who basically is this obsessive thought? Or are you somebody where, wow, this weird obsessive thought appears in my mind periodically? I think that those are kind of two different things, right? And sometimes our identities can really get wrapped up in our experiences, but our our identities are not our experiences. They're two distinct things. Um, so I, I just kind of, I'm sort of echolocating my way around that one, Dad. I don't know if you have a view on it, but that's just something that pops to mind to me as like an area that could be useful. That's fantastic. And one great simple way to practice the wisdom yeah, that you yeah. just offered there is to observe the difference between relating to something, an experience you're having, so mm -hmm. in the way of, I am thinking X, Y, or Z, okay? Mm -hmm. Compared to, there is the thought of X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, when in the first case, you're identifying with it, you're owning it, it's me, it's mine. In the second case, you're, there's much more of an accurate impersonality mm. in the perspective. Factually, we know intellectually, and, and over time you can feel it, which is weirdly liberating, <laughs> even though it seems counterintuitive, that all that you're experiencing, including your sense of personal identity, is being constructed by a whole bunch of impersonal processes, some of which have to do with a particular body. Much of them have to do with evolution over millions of years or current processes in society, including the impact of the way you were brought up. And it's kind of wild to, to go, you know, this, this neurosis is not my own. <laughs> then how can you take personal responsibility for it, and, which is productive, and how do you balance that? And, you, and including realizing that the sense of personal responsibility in a true and broad sense is actually not my own. But functionally, pragmatically, I'll treat it as my own for the purposes of uh, staying focused on something. Uh, all that said, you know, I loved what you said there about, about lightening up about identification. And that's a good way to summarize it, I think, lightening up about identification. So let's move on to our third question because we've spent some good time with that one. I can tell already, for us, by the way, to interrupt, that that first question just like softened up the ground, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, it does really, a great job of that, right? <laughs> both into a <laughs> deeper, kind of heartfelt place. <laughs> totally. No, I, and I think that it's good sometimes to have like, I, I don't know, I, maybe this is, a, this is a whole other thing. We've, we've talked about this on episodes in the past, but still it's, it's a whole other thing where um, it's just really easy for relationships to to kind of have like a calcification process that happens around them where we just mm. fall into these patterns of interaction with other people and the style and like the way you do something. And so every once in a while, it's kind of nice to like drop a polite hand grenade <laughs> into the middle of it and just kind of deconstruct the whole thing and, yeah. and start to make some more active choices about uh, about how you want it to be. So, And I think that sometimes these little like disruptive moments, like having to actually take a look at like, huh, is there something that's bumpy that we're doing? Um, can be really helpful in a weird sort of way, uh, particularly if you can recover from them effectively, which is, I think, part of what I was trying to say at the end of the first one. But yeah. I don't know. Maybe I, I put it better that way. But okay, anyways, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And third question, which gets to um, essentially backsliding and falling off the wagon. When my husband died suddenly at 57, I was not consciously aware that this tragedy pulled me back into some very unhealthy behavioral patterns. Now, with a lot of work over the last six years, I can look back on that loss and the trauma associated with it and realize that it snagged me back into my past. When something pulls us back into an old pattern, how can we avoid losing the growth we've spent so much time working on? Yeah. 
I've had versions of that that are much milder, um, yeah. not a tragic loss, but more like uh, returning to certain settings. Yeah, that, that's a big one. Yeah, that just reminded me a lot of high school. And I found myself mm. suddenly feeling tongue-tied, shy, and I wanted to withdraw and go into a corner and, and read a book. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, what, what, what happened to that assertiveness and aliveness and comfort with mm. people that I thought I'd acquired? Much of the way in which learning happens in our brain, in a sense, is in silos of different kinds. And as long as we're in a silo, that we've built up maybe with our personal growth and our therapy or you know, practice, so forth, then we're good. But if we get triggered out of it into another silo, then bam, we're back in junior high or back in age three with our super scary parent. And it's not that we've lost what we've built in that other, I'll call it a house, uh, the house of personal growth, sanity, and awakening. It's just that... Whoop, we got dragged into the garage, and there we are. Oh, what do we do? And so fear not. What you have learned, what you have acquired, hasn't disappeared. We're just not in touch with it. And mm -hmm. the name of the game a lot is to extricate ourselves from, as it were, the garage. And although I like my garage for all kinds of reasons, including <laughs> That's, I got my music and my workout machine in there. You know, what's not to like, right? Um and we want to get back into, let's say, the nice, comfortable living room uh, yeah. that we've developed over the years. And so it's normal to be triggered. That's kind of really important to appreciate that it's normal to get triggered. I mean, I've had experiences in which I felt sort of ashamed of myself or inadequate somehow that I got triggered about something. Here I am, someone who's a psychologist. I should know better. And then I just realized we're animals who evolved and are designed to get triggered including around particularly social triggers. So it's okay, it's normal. And just getting off your back about it and being kind to yourself about it, I think is really important. And then do everything you can. Um, kind of going back to Judd Brewer's work and the work of others, um, Katie Milkman, people we've had on the podcast, about healthy habits. Reassociate yourself with the cues, the stimuli, the healthy triggers of the way you want to be. You know, get back into certain practices, uh, rhythms of different kinds. Put yourself in certain settings. Get back into good company of, you know, people who bring out the best in you and you feel really good around um, naturally. Yeah, for me, it's kind of good news, bad news. And I guess even in the bad news, there's a little bit of good news, which is that when you develop anything, whether you're building a muscle or building a habit, building it the second time is always easier than building it the first time. Um, because you just already have the learning that's yeah, gone on in your yeah. brain and in your body. Yeah, so that that's the good news. The bad news is that when we get a, a taste of doing something a new and quote-unquote more evolved way, and then we uh, fall back into some old patterns, that feels painful in a way that just keeping on doing those patterns <laughs> wouldn't feel painful because we've gotten a glimpse of something new and different. And along with that can come a lot of like shame and self-recrimination. And in my experience, it's often like the shame of falling off the wagon that prevents people from returning to the more positive pattern of behavior as much as anything else. Um, and so like one of the really important things to be able to do is to be able to look at it and go, this is normal. Sure, I fell short of my new standard. I uh, I went to the gym once this week instead of three times or once this month instead of 12 times or whatever it is, which I've certainly done in the last couple of months. And that's not my aspiration for myself, but I'm not getting any value out of hitting myself with a stick about it. And I want to make it as easy as possible for me to go back to doing the behavior that I was getting some positive value out of. And I, I can't speak for you, Dad. I'm curious what your take on this is. But certainly for myself, if I stop doing something that I know is good for me, when I first start getting back to it, um, there's often a certain amount of cringe that like I wasn't just doing it the whole time. And it feels hard and uncomfortable. And, you know, it, it, there's just a lot of friction around it. Um, but I think that like managing the more difficult emotions around that process is just as important 
as the practicality of like reestablishing a good habit. Does that kind of make sense? Makes tremendous sense. And in this particular case, um, I don't myself beat myself up for slacking off when I finally get back to the weight machine. I mm, notice mm -hmm. that it's harder to do 12 reps, right? <laughs> and, you know, I'm paying a price a little bit, but mostly I'm feeling good that I finally got back to it. I guess that's mm, mm -hmm. usually mainly how yeah. it sort of shows up for me. I, I guess my experience of you is that, um, and, and I'm curious what your experience of you is, because I'm not inside your head, I just see you from the outside, is that you're not like a super self-critical person in that way. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you might have the cringe of like, oh, yeah, I should have been doing that. But hey, here I am today. And it feels like you can get to, well, here I am today pretty quickly. Is that, would you say that's fair? Yeah, that's so interesting. Again, in Resilient, we really unpack this. And I think it's helpful to discernment. Think about these elements here. So I'll just name three. Discernment, yeah. guidance, mm -hmm. and punishment. Yeah. You know, I think it's true to say and I'm very discerning of my own behavior and performance. Yeah. And I, I think your your high discernment, high guidance, pretty low punishment is what yep. I would say. There you are yeah. in a nutshell. And yeah. I think that's a great combination. Yeah, <laughs> I, I recommend that's, it. That's a good that's a good one. <laughs> and, and you know, if you could get to that one, it's a really, really good one. Um I, I guess one final thought about this person's specific question. Make it easy for yourself to mobilize back toward the good pattern of behavior is one of the best ways to reclaim growth. Like, even if it's just at the level of five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, as opposed to an hour or two hours of effortful action a day, um, having little moments where you think about yourself or toward yourself in a more nurturing fashion rather than a more punishing fashion, and then not punishing yourself too much for having moments where you think about yourself in a punishing fashion, you know, giving yourself the freedom to make incremental positive changes, mm. um, I think can be really useful for people. It's great. I'm really looking forward to this one because we get to <laughs> bring Rick in to an episode that I just recorded. Here it is. You recently published an episode on psychedelic assisted therapy. What's your perspective on psychedelic substances and plant medicine more broadly? taken with intention outside of a therapeutic context. This could include ayahuasca retreats or LSD or psilocybin trips that are done for maybe spiritual rather than recreational reasons. Wow, let's see. So we have three things, really. We have using um, psychedelics in psychotherapy. We have using psychedelics with a personal growth purpose, spiritual or psychological or both, outside of therapy. And then we have um, psychedelics taken without the frame or intention of some kind of psycho psychological benefit, which might happen, might not, but it's, we don't set in setting. You don't go into that with that being your set in yeah, your mind. Yeah, not the goal. Yeah. Uh, well, I have used psychedelics in the second and third category. Uh, when I was younger, especially, it's been I've probably two, if not three decades since, really. Uh, I've used psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, um, MDMA, ecstasy, maybe mescaline. Long, one of my early trips, it was a different <laughs> one. It was green and I liked it a lot. So, but even though mescaline's pretty rare. <laughs> I've never heard you talk about this, Dad. This wow! All right, <laughs> just really coming out. That's why we do the pod. But anyway, awesome, awesome. So, I, I, my view about this sort of thing, and it's also my view as someone who teaches meditation retreats and is rooted in, um, with great respect, a Buddhist lineage that has the fifth precept: not to use intoxicants or more exactly, not to uh, use substances that cloud the mind and lead to heedlessness. So the question being, uh, does you know, half a glass of wine or a toke of marijuana or you know, taking mushrooms with your friends on a Saturday cloud your mind and lead to heedlessness? That's a whole other thing. In that broader context, 
I'm really pragmatic about it. I think it's important to not underestimate uh, the addictive nature for certain vulnerable brains. And frankly, I have one of those vulnerable brains to the ways in which the brain wants the molecule. It, it wants that alcohol or marijuana or et cetera molecule. Interestingly, most people do not become addictive about psychedelics. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was one of the things we talked about during yeah. the conversation yeah. is that particularly on a physiological basis, these substances are by and large not physiologically mm -hmm. addictive. That's now right. there's a difference between physiologically addictive and psychologically addictive. Some people do get into habitual use patterns with things. Yeah. Um, but the truth is that particularly if you're doing like a fairly large dose of something of a classical psychedelic like LSD or psilocybin, most people do not come out of that experience and are like, yeah, I want to do it again tomorrow. You yeah, know, exactly. like that's just, that's just not the, the no, response. It's that usually that most much more like, whoa, that was really <laughs> weird. Oh. I want to digest that sucker <laughs> get, for a few weeks. Get back weeks to being six months to a year. Yeah, we'll yeah, talk about it. You know, I'm good. Something like I'm that, really good. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's really true. Usually. So, number yeah, one, usually. in my pragmatism, I, yeah. I, do, I do heed the value of being entirely substance free for all kinds of reasons, including the ways that it for can force a person to draw on other resources for their healing, growing, and awakening. Uh, psychological resources, meaningful relationships, other you know, physical activities, exercise, other things and substances. And I, I can appreciate people who you know, draw a line, not in a punishing kind of way, going back to the previous question, but in a sincere way. So I respect that view. That said, it's not exactly my own. I'm looser, a little looser about it, uh, including in my personal behavior. And um, I'm also pragmatic to go further. If a person, let's say, is in a meditation retreat and is you know, just afflicted with a chronic headache, you can practice with the headache or if you have a pain in your back or you have depressed mood or you have a naturally skittery attentional system. You're in the top 1% of distractibility constitutionally. That's your genetic profile. You know, if it helps you get the value of the meditation retreat to take some Advil or Zoloft or Adderall, pragmatically, okay, you know, that's said. So I'm pragmatic about it. So for me, the fundamental metric is taking into account risks. There are risks in psychedelics. They are serious, powerful substances. And, um, I have had wonderful experiences on them. I've had terrible experiences on them. The mm. worst psychedelic experience I had in my life was on nitrous oxide in a dentist's mm. office. And maybe there was something sure. in my body that's not yeah. right with it. Don't, don't underestimate the power of these tools, right? Yeah. But then with those caveats named, including recognizing your own vulnerability. Maybe you have a kind of loose personality structure, sort of, you know, the, the glue or the grout that keeps the tiles of your psyche in place is kind of really loose, or has been mm -hmm. banged hard by trauma or various other things. You know, then be especially careful. All right, all those caveats said. Uh, I think that the lasting impact in a structured setting uh, of psychotherapy is really, really quite potent potentially for many, many people. And the research on it is just shocking in terms of its benefits. Second, to the person's question, you know, outside of a therapy, outside of a structured setting with a licensed professional, but maybe with other people who are experienced guides, um, perhaps nested in a particular tradition of plant mm, medicine mm -hmm. and respect for sure. it. Uh, perhaps, a, um, if you forgive the use of this term, a, a more shamanistic kind of lineage uh, mm -hmm. involving the first people, uh, the native people around the world. Or you've got a buddy who's going to trip set for you. Or maybe you're quite experienced and you do it on your own. My favorite way to do psychedelics when I was doing them was by myself in nature. Mm. If you're doing it in that way, the risks are minimized. When you take these substances, you start to recognize so directly how constructed and arbitrary and impersonal, that word again, the stream of consciousness is. Mm -hmm. You recognize that when the 
the drug disrupts the conventional streaming, like, wow. And you recognize it when you start coming down and mm -hmm. the conventional psyche starts to sink its roots into you again mm -hmm. and how that is. So there's a lot of potential learning for you in the whole thing. So I'm, I'm really fine with it. Uh, I don't want to, mm -hmm. how can I put it? I want to be really clear. Hopefully I've given enough caveats and, and all the rest of that. And then when you step back from it, you kind of ask yourself, hmm, what have I gotten out of this? And if you look back on it and go, I've gotten a lot out of that, well, maybe do it, you know, the next time. If on the other hand, you look back and you go, I think I've gotten as much as I really want to get or I'm going to get, or you look back on it and go, you know, part of what draws me into this isn't that wise. And so I want to, you know, not be motivated by that particular force, which might include social approval or trying to be a cool kid or, you know, be liked by somebody else in the group. You know, maybe then you look and go, you know, cost benefits, the costs are outweighing the benefits. So I hope I haven't been, you know, annoyingly thorough, careful, and pragmatic here, but well, I don't think you've been annoyingly anything. I think that you you have been careful, and I, I just think that it's so funny on a human level that we're talking about this right now because you know you've you've shared some stories with me in the past, but we've never talked about it on the podcast or anything like that. Part of the initial question was focused on um, specifically a spiritual context, and there was this specific language that was used of plant medicine, and it's helpful for us to understand um, if you're listening to this and coming to this as a Westerner inside of the Western psychological tradition, that there is a very, 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 very long, mostly non-Western tradition around the usage of these substances from indigenous peoples, from all over the planet. Humans have been consuming psychedelic substances for literally thousands of years. So, you know, this has been going on for a long time. And it's appropriate Again, if you're trying to enter those spaces or those communities or those contexts as a as a as a Westerner, to be very appreciative and to be very thoughtful about that and to give a lot of um, space and respect for those more indigenous traditions and ways of doing things. For most people, if they're doing it with a thoughtfulness and an eye toward either individual or collective growth, their own growth on some aspect or the growth of a community that they're a part of, that's a really lovely reason to try something on. And I think the trying it on phrase is a good phrase here. And to be careful and thoughtful about the engagement with these things once you've tried them on and to really think about, huh, what are the reasons that I'm doing this? And as you were saying, dad, what are the benefits that I'm getting out of it? Or what are the problems that it's starting to cause for me? And if we can be kind of clear eyed about that, we're not hurting anyone else and we're having a grand old time and we're getting some personal value out of it and the people in our lives are starting to come to us and being like, hey, you just seem a lot more relaxed than you used to be and you don't get as kind of tight about stuff as you used to and just really feels like you've got a new perspective on things, then wow, you know, what's the problem? Add two points, maybe related yeah. mm -hmm. perhaps to what I'm kind of intuiting is inside the question. So sure. if a person is using psychedelics or any other way of directly physically altering your neurochemistry, let's say in a spiritual context, does that invalidate what you experience? If you experience through the psychedelics, say, that you that there is an underlying ground in reality that mysteriously beyond language is timeless and infused, let's say, with a, a benevolent awareness of everything. And when in touch with that apparent ground while tripping, everything's okay. Problems are okay. They're to be dealt with and they're okay. And there's complete release of burdensome self-preoccupations. There's no need for that maybe with some other insights. Okay. And then the drug wears off. The chemical gets metabolized. You come back. How do you interpret what you experienced or discerned? And just because the discernment and the experience was grounded in some physical process in your own body, 
does not inherently invalidate the validity, even the ontological nature, the existence even, of what you've discerned. Really important point. It's kind of like if um, suddenly the drug has pulled back the curtains in the, in the windows of perception and wow, you recognize this beautiful, radiant light. And then gradually the drug wears off and the curtains of the ordinary evolved constructed mind, which evolved in part to be contracted and miserable in order to survive <laughs> in part, uh, does it mean that the light is still not shining, even though the curtains, the shrouds have come back again? And I think it's really important to appreciate that whatever is reality is reality. Whatever the ground of reality is, is the ground of reality. And it may be that um, a drug helps us apprehend what's actually the case, but it doesn't mean that we're not apprehending something that's actually the case. Yeah, yeah, and there's, and you're probably more familiar with this than I am, Dad, because you're more involved in the Buddhist community than I am. Yeah, there is a long tradition in the Western Buddhist community of very well-known teachers using psychedelic substances. Some of them very publicly and very openly. Rosie Joan Halifax has written, wrote essentially a book about uh, her going to various indigenous communities and being involved in a variety of different ceremonies that involve the consumption of substances and the impact that that had on her. Uh, the name of the book is The Fruitful Darkness. I love that book. Um, and so what I have heard people from the Buddhist tradition say around a lot of this stuff is that like sometimes you can consume a substance that can give you a level of insight into what might be possible. And then you come back, you come down, and you're like, oh, I can't do that on my own right now. And then people try to go through a process of being able to get to a similar space without the assistance of a substance. So, but sometimes having just like the glimpse of the possible can itself be very helpful because there can be kind of a roadmap in that or an intuition around a, what a person could accomplish with some deliberate effort over time. Your brain's doing it. It's doing it with the assistance of a chemical, but it's your brain that's doing it as near as we can tell. Um, and I think that that can be really helpful for people. But again, what most of these people have said about it is that the goal is to get to the place where you don't need the substance. Like that's the whole point. Um, but sometimes there's an aspect of it that can help you with the intuition part. Beautifully said. Fantastic. Yeah. That was my second point. Um, awesome. Gurdjieff uh, apparently had this line that drugs are like telescopes. They show you what's possible, but then mm. you need to walk there on your own. Kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And that also gets at the distinction of doing a, a trip, uh, whether in a structured psychotherapeutic setting or, or not, that produces a self-lasting change. I've yeah. had, in my mid-20s, I had a series of psychedelic experiences that mm -hmm. helped me clear up an extremely deep and long-standing personal issue. Mm -hmm. um, and they, it resolved through that. It was you cleared. Wow, okay. Often, though, the trip helps you discern what's true or drop into what's true, but then it fades. That's why it's so important to do what you can afterward to help it yeah. stabilize and, you know, so that you can rest there increasingly on your own, exactly like you said. Yeah, totally. And uh, that's part of the reason that when you have these psychedelic-assisted therapy sessions, uh, the the most time is spent before and after the psychedelic assisted session itself. There is one or two psychedelic assisted sessions and then quite a bit of both time leading into the session and then critically integration uh, sessions as they're often caused, which occur after the psychedelic assisted one where the person chews on and digests and goes over what happened with the clinician so that they can really integrate that back into their, their life without the substance. So wow, what a what a trip that that question was, Dad. I, I didn't really see that one coming. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, so our next and I think our last question for this episode. I wonder if you know the book Humankind: A Hopeful History by Rutger Bergman. It argues that people are decent at heart and proposes a new worldview based on the corollaries of this optimistic view of human beings. 
My sense is that many of the negative stories around human nature that pervade our culture are constructed or otherwise on thin ground. And there's no doubt, extremely terrible things have happened, still happen, and probably will always happen. But I think on balance, there's often more good around than bad. If you know the book, do you think it has a rose-colored glasses view, or is it consistent with what you both think? Well, I, I know of the book, and I think it's a very solid, important, worthy effort. And I also know the question that the person's really getting at. And one version of this is, what is human nature? It's a classic question. Are we yeah. naturally devils who need to be highly regulated and controlled by society with raw, savage ids that are prepared to erupt at any moment, so we need to civilize ourselves? Kind of a psychoanalytic and often religious view. Or alternately, are we angels by our nature who need just a little bit of regulation and more than anything else, opportunities to express their goodness? And my personal answer to that is that we have two natures. Uh, and you know we know the parable, the two wolves in the heart, one of love, one of hate, a metaphorical way of talking about this. And the way I look at it is that the wolf of love, as it were, the, the kindness in the title of the book, humankind, right? The kindness in people, the caring and sharing aspect of people, compassion and justice is actually really central to our nature. It was seriously supported over the last three or so million years in the evolution of the brain as unlike any other primate species, our hunter-gatherer ancestors organized their lives on a foundation broadly stated of caring and sharing, as Paul Gilbert puts it, compassion and justice, rather than the social organization of other primate species, which is grounded in what Gilbert calls holding and controlling, in which a few members of the group, a few alphas, dominate and control all the betas. So the good news is that caring and sharing, kindness, is really native to us. And the good news today also is, if you look out at the world, ordinary life is dominated by little exchanges that have caring and sharing in them, with even with complete strangers, uh, quite routine. On the other hand, that uh, kind of ancient atavistic capability of leaning into holding and controlling, including as hunter-gatherers against other hunter-gatherer bands, that has left us with a capability that is unfortunately all too easily activated toward callousness, cruelty, that's just stunning. And you don't need laboratory studies uh, in which there are you know, questionable ma manipulations maybe to recognize just the routine atrocities, uh, in, including in the modern world. Uh, so what are we gonna do about it? I mean, for me, the real uh, takeaway here is kind of twofold. Good news, when people are not being threatened in their core, and they're not being manipulated typically by an authoritarian leader who is playing on our vulnerability to grievance and payback, they tend to be really pretty decent, pretty cooperative, pretty reasonable, pretty friendly, pretty easygoing. We tend in that direction. On the other hand, we are vulnerable, really vulnerable to the drumbeats of fear and uh, grievance and retribution. And therefore, it's extremely important to pay attention to social factors, societal factors, because that's what enables the fundamental goodness in people and kindness in people to really have a chance to come out, including applied to those who are not like me. A way of thinking about this is that given how beautiful our human nature can be, by contrast, so much of our history, so much of it has been terribly brutal and horrible. So it's especially tragic, given that it doesn't have to be that way. And it's especially important going into the 21st century that we uh, move strongly toward caring and sharing, toward compassion and justice, 
as the foundation of all human societies. Yeah, I think that was a great answer, Dad, for starters. And for me, I really approach a lot of this in terms of like, how do we get the ideas that we have about the world? Mm. And I think it's a really important question to always yeah. ask ourselves, right? Like, where does that view come from? <laughs> you know, like, like who, where did we get the view that like humans are kind of bad on the inside? And it's like, okay, all of these ideas are situated inside of a context. And if you look at something like that idea, the context of it um, is by and large a Christian context uh, happening in Europe, largely in about 1200 until about 17, 1800, depending on where you want to draw the lines. And uh, that view is that, you know, man is uncivil and um, we need to apply a lot of intense top-down regulation in order to control people's impulses. Otherwise, they are going to behave in a way that we don't want them to behave. So it all just comes back essentially to power and control. Um, and that viewpoint really supports a lot of very authoritarian perspectives. Like if people are bad, then we must control them. But if they are not, then do we have to control them still? And the answer mostly is kind of no. Um, and that leads to a very, very different kind of global functioning and a very different kind of governmental system and a very mm. different kind of religious system and so on yeah. and so on. Once you start making different assumptions about the way that people are. So it's important for us to think in that way. And then if you even think about like early psychology, like you were kind of pointing to Freud there for a second, which is, you know, the the toxic id buried inside of ourselves that we must constantly defend ourselves against. Turn of the century, right? Like 1900. Victorian. Victorian. What's going on in the world right then, right? We're looking at the Industrial Revolution. We're looking at all of these conflicts. We're on the eve of World War One. You know, like it's a messy moment in time. Um, and so it's really, really helpful for us to think about those those philosophical perspectives inside of their practical context. For me, in truth, I think that humans aren't good, and I think that they aren't bad. I think that they're really tribal. We're big apes. That's what we are. We like the ones that are kind of like us. We don't like the ones that aren't like us, and we don't trust them, and we don't want to share our food with them. And thankfully, we can apply a lot of top-down regulation to inspire our more positive parts and kind of be thoughtful internally and regulate our less positive parts. But but I, I don't think that humans are good or bad. I think they're tribal. And I think that you can look at most of human history through that lens and have it just make a lot of sense. I agree, kind of. <laughs> kind of. But I want to okay, flag okay. one little thing. All right, thing. you want to flag a thing? Okay, good, good. <laughs> Bodhicitta. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> what yeah. I, what I mean is... I just invite people to look inside and mm. if you just kind of take a breath and slow down for a moment and you know in the in the moments that you're not in agonizing pain you're not fighting for your life what's the natural inclination in you what's your natural first inclination generally it's pretty positive you know toward kind of simple pleasures you want to learn something want to make something it's like a leaning, a natural leaning toward benevolence, including toward yourself, and often with feelings that flow or associate with that benevolence, a kind of simple friendliness or kindness or uh, generosity. You know. And even, I would say, under the layer level-ish that I've described so far, can you discern inside yourself? what can feel mysteriously impersonal, transpersonal, not necessarily connected with something supernatural or transcendental, but something that feels beyond your gender, beyond your personality, beyond your history, that has kind of mysteriously a, a quality of wisdom and, and wakefulness and good wishing in it, way deep down. You don't find it there, okay. I think you'll find it there. I think it's there in just about everyone. Yeah, no, just uh, to contribute one little thing here at the end that just supports what you're saying, Dad. A really interesting study uh, that I saw when I was doing prep for some other episode of ours was on um, these games that people set up in laboratory settings where they're either incentivized or disincentivized from cooperating from other players. 
And uh, they essentially try to do these game theory simulations to determine whether or not people default to cooperation or they default to conflict. And what they found was when people had to make quick decisions, when they had to make choices quickly, they became more cooperative. Hmm. And when they were given time to think about it, they became more selfish, hmm. basically, which suggests in a kind of crude way, maybe a small thing that you're talking about here, which is that the nature might be cooperative, but then we start worrying about the consequences to us about that cooperative nature, hmm. and so we start censoring it in different ways. But I agree with you. I think this is mostly the kind of question that you can't really look at in the laboratory, and, and it's more about our own inquiry into ourselves and into other people. Yeah. Awesome. I think this one was really interesting. I was shocked that we went as in on the psychedelics question as we did here, Dad, and I thought that that was fantastic. Uh, so thanks for being so there for it. I learned a lot during this one, too. So thanks for doing this with me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. So today we focused on answering a number of questions from our listeners. And the first one was fairly personal, and it asked about the challenges that still remained inside of Rick and Maya's relationship with each other. And I really appreciated this question because it gave us an opportunity to talk about the reality that people are people. Even if they've spent a long time working in mental health and personal growth and thinking about psychology and all of that kind of stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have this perfect idealized relationship. And also just gave me an opportunity to talk about something that I've just noticed a lot in the personal growth and mental health world, which is that there's a lot of performance of perfection. There is a lot of pretending to have a perfectly realized relationship because there are a lot of people out there whose income, frankly, depends on them convincing people that they have a perfectly realized relationship and they can teach you how to do the same thing for just three easy payments of $99 or, you know, whatever. And the reality is that we've had like so many people on this podcast who are lovely people and they're they're very thoughtful people and extremely intelligent people and they really have spent a lot of time working on their own stuff. But a lot of them would be just the first people to say, it still makes me mad when somebody cuts me off in traffic, okay? Like we're all still human. It's really okay here. And so attached to that, we talked about some of the bumps that happen in our relationship. Like I still say things sometimes that rub my dad the wrong way. He still has mannerisms that rub me the wrong way. I think the difference is that we feel like we can talk about them in a really safe and comfortable way with each other. And more so than anything else, we really feel like we're on the same team as each other. So when things come up, I feel like I can say almost anything to my dad and, you know, he might not agree with it. He might not love what I'm saying, but he's going to give it the benefit of the doubt and he's going to do his best to be responsive to whatever it is that I'm saying. And I, I think that he feels the same way about me. The second question focused on dealing with obsessive thoughts, and Rick named a number of things that somebody can do if they've had a thought that's filled up a bit too much brain space for a long period of time. My only real contribution here was just saying that it can be really helpful to get a bit of separation from our thoughts and to not identify with them extra closely. And then Rick expanded on that by talking about the ways in which we can move out of identification altogether, maybe even disidentifying to an extent with uh, the nature of the self or seeing the thoughts and feelings that arise inside of us in a more airy and insubstantial kind of way. And when we do this, it often empowers us to be able to do more about them. Then the third question was about falling out of positive behavioral patterns and back into some more problematic ones, particularly when we get knocked back into those problematic patterns by some kind of an event that occurs in our lives. And Rick began just by saying that it's helpful to know that this is really common. People get triggered. They get activated. We move from one circumstance into another, and we fall back into this old way of functioning. Uh, speaking personally, this often happens when I'm around different kinds of people, like when I'm back around people that maybe I went to high school with. All of a sudden, I start kind of feeling like a high schooler again, and I find myself falling into these old patterns of behavior with them. And both Rick and I really focused on the idea of incremental change here. What can you do to move a little bit at a time back into the more positive pattern? What can you do to lower the threshold to make it easier for yourself to move back into that positive pattern? And then along the way, how can we be kinder to ourselves? Rick had, I think, this really useful uh, distinction between guidance and judgment. And I would say that Rick is a pretty high guidance person, but he's a pretty low judgment or criticism person. 
And I think that really helps him kind of bounce back if he does have a little moment there where he becomes a little bit less consistent in some positive practice of his. Then, and this kind of blew my mind a little bit, we talked for a while about psychedelics and about whether or not it's appropriate to use psychedelics outside of a therapeutic context. The question specifically dealt with more spiritual contexts, but we broadened the lens a little bit to include really any situation where you're approaching the experience with a growth mindset. And Rick spoke really openly about his past experiences and some of the value that he got out of them, and then alongside that, some cautions that he had for people if they were thinking about engaging with these substances themselves. The focus for both of us, I think, was on making sure that people are doing these things in a safe and supportive environment, and that they are being appropriately thoughtful about what they're getting themselves into, and that they're doing it with an eye to not harming, not harming themselves, not harming other people. And then, with these substances, if you choose to engage with them, which to be clear, is illegal in the United States to do this, having a couple of different ideas in mind can be useful. The first one is that, wow, you can have some wild experiences on these substances, and those experiences can be profoundly useful for people. The second is that the insights that you have while on these substances are real insights. Uh, they may or may not be accurate, but they're real. Like, you had them in that moment. That was really how you felt. And we can use those insights to become more, well, insightful about the nature of ourselves or the nature of reality and all of that. And these insights can be a kind of guidance toward what might be possible when you're not under the influence of anything. And just getting a sense for possibility is itself a really, really useful thing that these substances can do. We close the episode by talking about human nature. And both of us were very suspicious about the negative slant that many people put on human nature. I really focused on the cultural context that a lot of those observations came out of, while Rick really emphasized what's actually true about us underneath it all when we're not under a lot of scarcity pressure. And he thinks that for most people, if they look inside themselves, if they're feeling pretty full already, there isn't a lot of scarcity in their life, they're kind of comfortable, they're doing okay, what do we see? Well, we see often a pretty open and generous heart, or at the very least, a kind of underlying ground that's just really okay. It's not looking for somebody to hurt or somebody to harm. So that's it for today. If you enjoyed the episode, I'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to it wherever you're listening to it now on, and maybe even leave a rating and a positive review. It really does help us out. If you'd like to submit a question to be answered on the show, the best way to do that is to join us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast, and for just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and receive a bunch of bonuses in return. Until next time, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.